as you know, this series is about um, people and things that have helped to shape St. Petersburg, and indeed any town, really. And one of the questions that has come up often w in comments is, how does education and a university shape a town? And um, who else is better than Margaret Sullivan to address that issue? Um, and especially now that she's leaving, um, I think that she can uh, maybe be a little more candid and actually have <laughs> a, a, um, a good perspective on um, the value of education and the way in which it can interface with St. Pete. Um, but we always start with the same question. So how did you come to St. Petersburg? Quite by mistake, Carol. <laughs> 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 I'm the unexpected chancellor uh, during an unexpected time, uh, both for the university as well as my family and my life. Uh, I worked with USF in Tampa in 2001-2002 as Dr. Genchaf came to the university. Later on in 05-06 when St. Pete became initially accredited. And then I was brought back to USF Tampa in 2008 to work with the issues in St. Petersburg, a governance report that Tampa had to prepare, the accreditation of Sarasota, mm -hmm. and the uh, hope for accreditation of the Polytechnic. So I was sent here to do those four tasks. The first six months I was here, uh, again, St. Petersburg was put on probation uh, by the accreditors, and that gave them a limited time mm -hmm. to succeed in the concerns, or the students would have lost their financial aid. Mm -hmm. And we were rapidly running out of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, I'd worked with the accreditors for 10 years prior to that, and it was the primary focus of my coming, was to ensure that the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, met all the requirements. Hmm. And, and that's how I got And here. so why did they choose you? Well, I'd been their consultant for many years. Uh, uh, for those who know me, um, I am not a, uh, a quiet administrator. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there were things that needed to be done and needed to be done quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, that moves things in a university through many committees. Uh, at the time I came, the faculty did not know as a group why they'd been placed on probation. Mm -hmm. And that was the first part. And once they knew the task, they were off to the races. Mm -hmm. And they did an extraordinary job. In fact, their, uh, their program and what they designed and did is probably regionally exemplary. It is really outstanding. So why is it important for a university or a college to be accredited? What does that actually mean? Well, there are practical reasons. Mm -hmm. The practical reasons, of course, is it allows an institution to be respected by its peers uh, and indeed allows the Department of Education to provide financial aid to the mm. students. Those are the practical reasons. The uh, prestige reasons, of course, would be uh, somewhat in the history of the Southern Association, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools was established by uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Vanderbilt, and others more than 120 years ago in order to show that the education, university level education in the South was very fine. Mm. At that period of time, they really did think that the South was not perceived as a bastion mm -hmm. of university strength. Mm -hmm. And those institutions were fundamental in starting the association. At one time, it was voluntary. Student aid was not attached to it, but it was seen as a level of acceptance by peers. Mm -hmm. And those institutions that were not accredited were seen in a different light. And are there benefits to faculty and students to be in an accredited university? There are, uh, again, transfer of credits among institutions. Entrance into graduate or professional schools mm -hmm. uh, would assure the receiving institution that certain conditions existed in the institution that was coming. Those are primarily related to the quality of the faculty, uh, the examination of the curriculum, what's taught. In the uh, St. Petersburg issue, the one issue we had with Sachs was that we did not test or evaluate our freshman sophomore coursework mm 
mm -hmm. uh, so that all institutions that are accredited have to have assessment practices in place mm -hmm. that can assure uh, the graduate that mm -hmm. they have performed at a level expected mm -hmm. for the institution. Uh, again, though, lack of accreditation, as you might have seen in the press, for example, has been a burden for the Polytechnic. Right. Uh, and uh, it does take a period of time to meet mm -hmm. those standards. And so, again, it is seen by many as essential. So any new university or college won't be accredited Correct. immediately. Correct. And is there a preliminary time period? Somewhere? It depends. It hmm. very much depends. Ave Maria was the last institution, new institution in the region, I believe, perhaps, sure, certainly in Florida, uh, that uh, went through the accrediting process. And their experience took them seven years. Hmm. So what exactly does a chancellor do? <laughs> <laughs> Anything that needs to be done. As I left the office today, I asked the maintenance staff to give me eight large black bags <laughs> and some plastic gloves so that I could take on the beach this weekend because of all the, and if anybody's not, not too busy Saturday morning, come along. Hmm. Uh, but the chancellor does whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, as I stayed in the position longer, I found it more comfortable to delegate than I did <laughs> when I first came. <laughs> and the last week, I have delegated a lot. I just pressed <laughs> the forward button on my... <laughs> 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 All the forwarded emails say, for your information, take care of it, M. <laughs> Well, no I, one I can have fire done that you, three can years they? Ago. <laughs> I mean, what are they going to do? <laughs> but, but again, the, the one option that they may do is to lay low and think that I've forgotten at my advanced <laughs> years that I sent the email. I see. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's one thing that I've been a able to hold on to. <laughs> so this, um, the thing that you accomplished, I mean, you accomplished lots of things and, and um, Hank, enumerated many them. of them. But this thing about getting accreditation and uh, being autonomous, um, could you explain exactly what this means? Because you're not, USFSP is not a completely independent institution. There's some connection, but you are autonomous. So could the, you? The autonomous word is a SACS word. It's an accrediting word. In hmm. order to be accredited, you have to be academically and financially autonomous. That means that you make your own decisions and your board makes your own decisions and through whatever process they've defined. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, for example, Mr. Huff, on the same standing as the University of Florida. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh we have New College, which is accredited, mm -hmm. and they have about 750 students. Uh, there is a college in Texas that I've worked with that has had 47 students, but the decisions they make related mm -hmm. to their academic programs and their budgets are solely theirs. We do have a campus board, and our campus board is solely responsible for financial decisions made on behalf of the institution. That board, however, does give their uh, materials through the board in Tampa. And what's that mean? That their means material. you forward your, let's say we were building the new building. Okay. Uh, the student center? The student center. And, going and so we would send, as part of our agreement with Tampa, uh, we would send our, uh, our decisions forward for approval by the board. In first Tampa. through the campus board, uh -huh. and the campus board would then move that on to the USF board in Tampa. The strange circumstance in this state is that legislation required the accreditation of St. Petersburg, Sarasota Manatee, and Polytech. That decision was not made by USF Tampa. It was legislated. Because of the legislation, which also gave us campus boards of five members each. And that was in 2000 and? Well, for Sarasota Manatee and St. Pete, it was in 2001, 2002, mm -hmm. much later for Poly. Mm -hmm. But the legislation is similar. Mm -hmm. So with that legislation, 
then the Board of Regents at that time wrote a letter back to USF and USF St. Pete that said, you are approved to be an institution mm. for accreditation purposes only. Mm. In that letter, when they wrote that, they did not understand what it meant for accreditation mm. purposes only. So because of that, that occurred to USF St. Pete in 2006. And since 2006, USF St. Petersburg and Tampa have been working on that relationship. Uh, again, if you're working with a school so much larger, and many of the decisions you make on day-to-day -day basis are with middle management people all over the system, that it takes a long time for everybody to understand this changing mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. And that, that has been a, a true challenge. Now, what would be the advantage of being completely separate, and what are the advantages of keeping that relationship? All right, the relationship as a system, in terms of the students, is probably one important factor. The students at USF St. Petersburg, we have about 6,000, 6,500 students, but all of those students can take any of the courses in Tampa that they wish. A school our size could not have the thousands of opportunities for the students. So it has a broad array of, of uh, academic choices because of the system. Second thing, of course, and our students are here tonight, the second thing is the social life can be much broader. Uh, we do not have um, uh, the capability to either house or develop a football team. Hmm. Our students in the future would like to be known as the Bull Sharks, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Is there, have but, they voted on that? No, but they keep printing off jaws and sending <laughs> it around. <laughs> In fact, our meal plan, I think, is now known as shark bites. I'm not <laughs> certain. Uh, well, well, lady shark sounds better than lady bulls. Or shark -a and shark us. <laughs> shark eye, plural, male. <laughs> Sorry, academic yeah, joke. Uh, but, but in any instance, there's a much broader social So a, life. a student who's enrolled at USFSP could play on the football no, team? No, they oh, cannot, they, they cannot. cannot. NCAA would restrict that. Oh. Uh, uh, and all the NCAA teams, because again, we have our own numbers, we are separately accredited. Uh, and you have a sailing that, team. Uh, the sailing team is mm -hmm. uh, different, it's not NCAA to start with. Mm. And we have, um, it's a club team and a mm. competitive team. Uh, and there is, uh, uh, it is a, we have, I think, one or two students from Tampa that are allowed to mm. work on that because the guiding light of that compet competitive group mm. allows that. Mm. But in football, of course, and basketball and all those other things, what people would be doing, of course, would be making relationships with any seven-foot person yeah. that weighed 300 pounds <laughs> <laughs> out at P-TECH, you know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but again, so I think the NCAA has very hmm. strong regulations for uh, that right. level that they're in now. So this relationship you have with Tampa, you know, USF Tampa, is complicated. Very. I mean, it's really, I, I've talked to you about, I've talked, I can't quite get my hand around it. And there's money issues and... Um, yes, and, and money is probably the main issue. And will be in the future because, as you know, uh, all the institutions in Florida took a $300 million cut this year. Uh, our budget at USF St. Pete is now down 58% from the time that I came. Uh, mm. That is incredibly difficult for a school our size because about 80% of our operations are based on state monies and tuition. 17% mm. of the Tampa budget is based on the state allocation because they have lots of resources. Dorms that have been paid for that throw mm. off money each year, uh, grants where they get a lot of funding, uh, so that they have multiple sources of resources that we have not grown up and developed mm. at this time. So that uh, the state allocation is a big issue for us. Mm -hmm. And tuition, of course, is a big issue for mm -hmm. us as well. But money, uh, money matters. Right. Uh, the stresses and strains between the uh, institutions 
would be much lighter were there gallons of buckets of money stashed around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you do um, pay Tampa for services as yes. well. In 2001, 2002, uh, the institution entered into a contract with Tampa so that they handled such things as information technology, student information systems, um, uh, budget and control, audit, and those types of functions. Uh, in 2001, 2002, USF St. Pete was also paying each college in Tampa $25,000 per college. The budget at that time, again, was approximately $2 million. When I got to USF St. Pete, uh, the institution was paying Tampa about $3.3 million. In a SACS world each year, in a SACS world- What's a SACS world? The creditors. Okay. In the, if you, a newly accredited institution typically will contract for services that have not been developed in that institution. And the accreditors typically see that money decreasing each year, not increasing. So that the cost for services uh, it's always been an issue. When I came, the expectation of the uh, chief financial officer, who is no longer in Tampa, told me that he thought it would be appropriate to triple my cost allocation. Needless to say, that was a very difficult year. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, uh, contract killings passed through my mind. <laughs> 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 Uh, but this year, we, and over the last three years, we've had a cost assessment uh, that have been difficult negotiations. But this year, we will be paying Tampa $2.1 million, uh, or $2,011,000, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that uh, those costs now will have decreased approximately a $1 million from, from when we started into the discussion. And those costs will remain until or if you for three years we made a three-year agreement oh yeah. because uh my concern at the time and particularly in my uh retiring uh that i wanted the institution to be strong enough to go through the negotiation process once mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. so do you foresee us fsp being an independent entity from tampa ever it will very much depend upon the state of Florida. Because hmm. um, that'll be legislated. It may be legislated. Uh, it might uh, occur under all sorts of circumstances. Uh, at the present time, I don't think the environment would suggest that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. My goal at St. Pete was to ensure the future of the institution, regardless of how it was governed. Mm -hmm. A good institution is good regardless of who's governing it. We came in, when I came in, we, we were on probation. Two years later, we were classified as a Carnegie community engaged master's level institution ranked 36 by US News and World Report. Mm. So Bravo. I think that if indeed you have a fine institution, state govern institutions different ways. Mm -hmm. But if you're good, it doesn't make any difference how you're governed. And mm -hmm. USF St. Pete is good. I would not have come here. I'd been a, around a whole lot, many of you know, through the Southeast. Never have I seen the quality of the faculty in a school this size. Mm -hmm. And the students aren't any slouches either. Aww. Uh, but so, uh, so the, all the basics are covered at this institution. Uh, and all it can do now is blossom even under difficult economic times. What is the difference between a state university, public, and a private university like Eckerd? How do you see that as well, one different? Well, tuition way? being one. Uh, Eckerd's a lot. Yes, but well worth it, by the way. Mm -hmm. the, the, the group you have in St. Pete, you've got Johns Hopkins and their interest in medical. You've got USF, marine science top flight, great mm -hmm. advantage to the city. You have Eckert, quite different. Liberal arts, residential, that's what they want to be in. They're really good at it. Mm -hmm. You have St. Pete College, workforce development, all of that, top flight. Mm -hmm. And you have P-TECH, also serving the community in a very fine way. So that, again, having been here with Don Eastman and mm -hmm. with Bill, 
law mm -hmm. and the others, it's been a great run. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll see that in um, the development of McDonald's, you'll also see McDonald's on one, one quarter, Wendy's on the other, and you'll see Burger King on the third corner. Mm -hmm. I think that in some industries, like higher education, mm -hmm. the cohesive group brings about something much more special than any of those schools could do alone. Mm -hmm. and That's uh, very interesting yeah. that they're, it's not a competition, it's a group They're working together. Right. And again, when we go forward and talk, uh, mm -hmm. we worry about our budgets, we worry about our tuition, but if we're with our legislators, we talk about FRAG, which is a, a how the state helps fund students in private schools. Mm -hmm. Remember, my students two years ago paid $4,604 for nine months of tuition and fees. $4,604. However, the cost of educating that student was about 11,005. Hmm. So the state is paying me, not anymore by the way, <laughs> but let's just say for purposes, I have 6,000 students and I'm being subsidized by the state $5,000 a student. Hmm. But FRAG, the state assist to private schools is less than it would cost the state to send them to St. Pete. So FRAG is a big buy for the state. And tuition, for example, at St. Pete College is lower than ours. Good buy for the students. Mm -hmm. So that, again, Eckert brings in. How much is Eckert tuition? Marty, you have any idea? About 20,000, Bill? About 20,000. Tu tuition at Eckert? But More would, than 20000 a year? Yeah, probably about twenty five. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, and they also have a good a bit of aid as well. Mm -hmm. but so where does the private college get um, their funding? From donors? And mostly from tuition. Mm -hmm. Unless you're talking about Harvard. Mm -hmm. You could operate Harvard without students probably <laughs> until I <laughs> pass <Okay>. on. <laughs> good idea. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got a new plan, you two. <laughs> How much fun can we have with that students? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we've mentioned that there's all these um, universities and colleges in St. Pete. So the question is, uh, you know, how does higher education impact the way a oh. city runs and it's just its quality? Well, you can start with the basic economics. We have 700 employees making reasonably good salaries uh, mm -hmm. and living in the community, buying, so they have the economic impact of any university is very high, which is probably one reason why Lakeland was interested in their own university. Mm -hmm. So the economic impact is one thing, but let's talk again, um, in this instance, if you talk about John Hopkins, then they're doing right. everything in the universe in the medical area. But right. let's just talk about USF St. Pete, because today it proved to me what higher ed is all about. Economic impact, very high, with high, well-educated people associated with the institution. The matter of Dali, uh, we helped in the 80s when the Dali mm -hmm. came in terms of buying the warehouse, we helped once again this time around. So let's say in assisting with things such as the Dali, mm -hmm. just economic decisions that benefit the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. But the real benefit today was shown, Christian, and we have something called Stingray and Project 10. This project at St. Pete takes students that have been in special education until their 18th year. And we bring those students, uh-oh, this is going to be hard, uh, to the university, and we put them in um, mm. classes that they can feel comfortable in. In the past, they've had to go back in the high schools. The high schools were responsible for them. And so once they got to be 18, the high schools still had responsibilities for them, so they'd put them back in some old class with students six years younger. Mm. And so we brought in Project 10, and Christian works with that project, but we lost one of those students this weekend. And we got a note from his family, or from Bill Heller, the dean. Mm. That boy came to us, 
worked with the project, went to the classes, some art, some time management. We found him a job, or he found his job at, at uh, Publix, working happily, had his own apartment on the, ta on the trap for independence, and he mm. passed away. Now, the trick of it is that his proudest day was even when he finished his certificate program at USF St. Pete. He had tons of USF St. Pete clothing. <laughs> so he showed up wearing it all the time. Mm. Banners, and I thought, well, how does the university, what is the university in the real world? The university is what we did for that boy mm -hmm. and what he did for us. Because they gave mentors and he was in each class very popular and the whole experience was just what you would want a university to be. Mm -hmm. But then there's the other side of it, of course, which is research, uh, which is, again, we are Pinellas School. We work with SRI on math education. What's SRI? Uh, Stanford Research Institute, oh. hanging yeah. out on the right. point, right. Uh, looking into harbor security. Right. <laughs> Bomb sniffing dolphins. <laughs> Heck, I don't know, Carol. <laughs> But they have worked with us as partners in trying to improve the Pinellas schools. And we are a Pinellas University. Hmm. And look at all the students that we take. What do we do? Our students finish a good number. We have Hillsboro students, too. Finish at their school. And we open the door to the world to them. Yes. You know, if they come in and, and catch the fever, which many of them do, then, then they go graduate schools, they mm -hmm. go to work. And many of you here have seen the Gazelle Lab story about entrepreneurship and being at the Mahaffey and finding great ways to fund. That's our Reuben man yeah. here. If anybody's seen, seen these swings around town who I consider to be a great liability, you can thank <laughs> Reuben for them. <laughs> but what we are doing in our institution is producing students finishing up to see the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. They don't rely on somebody else to make their living. They are very competent in seeking their own future. Who would have thought to put swings all over town? Yeah. I'm afraid to get in one. Yeah. There must be some weight limit. <laughs> well, one of the things I really like about your campus, and it fits exactly what you're saying, is the banners. Have people been on campus? Because the banners have pictures of students, and maybe faculty and staff, no, all, and students. all students, and they have a saying on them. And it really is part of what our town was about, is about. It's getting to know who these people are so you recognize them. Who are these students? What do they have to say? And I love that I go on your campus and I feel like I'm being introduced to the people that there are two of them. make it up. <laughs> and um, the way you sp speak about the students and how they create, it, it's very much like who creates St. Pete? Well, we all do. And it, I'd love if everybody's photograph was up around St. Pete, you know, with the Dali banners. We had, you know, photographs of each of us with a little saying. So we got to know who are these people who really make, make the, the place. place. And you, w and so when that I go there. That was a competition, there, by the way. It's so wonderful. I really and then we, applaud then we you. Did, uh, then we did a security check on those heads we put yes. up there. <laughs> Well, I did think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Stalking. <laughs> and things like Axe that. murderer. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in the town, then, um, you know, when corporations come in, they get tax breaks and they don't have to pay property tax for like 20 years or something. You don't pay property tax because you're not. Not pro a state institution. We pay some things on those auxiliaries that make money. Mm -hmm. In my world, very few things make money. <laughs> 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 I'd love to pay taxes. <laughs> Give me a chance. <laughs> um, but because you're this resource, um, I've just been in New Jersey. So there's this big issue going on about Rutgers and being the state university and splitting it up. It's very interesting with what's going on in Florida. And um, one of the things about the charter of Rutgers, the state university, is that it's to be, it's supposed to be the research arm for the state. So if the state has an issue, they're supposed to go and get 
them to do it. Right. So mm -hmm. do you have that relationship with St. Pete or with Pinellas? Do they come to you and seek the brilliance, and I know there's some brilliant faculty members in here, and seek their advice in terms of how to make decisions? I think that's an informal process. Mm. I don't think it's an institutional request. Mm -hmm. But again, our faculty typically serve in various capacities in the city. You know, Herb Polson was a longtime council member, mm -hmm. you know, yes. so that uh, most of that advice in many of the boards include faculty members for mm -hmm. that purpose. Uh, so what a resource. Oh, yeah. Now, there's some research. Again, our undergraduates, uh, the criminal justice students each year. We have a very large undergraduate research farm, and I can't wait each year. I run in there because our CJ criminal justice students get all the facts and, uh, and any type of crime all over the city, and they put pens in the map, and then they color it to show where is the least safe place, and then they deliver it to the city. The city never asks, but they <laughs> deliver it to the city. <laughs> And uh, uh, I remember one year, I don't know if this, is, I don't think this is the case anymore, but uh, one of the bars had all sorts of pins in it when I looked <laughs> at it. And I thought, gee, I thought that was a nice place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to go out there again. You know? <laughs> then I started getting from my window watching ambulances mm -hmm. to see if I could match them up to the pins. <laughs> But we do a lot of, uh, a lot of research, um, uh, even for our admissions, we do a lot of research on what the schools are producing. Uh, we have high, relatively high admission standards. So for mm -hmm. us, a day-by-day -day accounting or year-by-year -year of the quality and the demographics of the students that are being graduated from Pinellas High School, mm -hmm. very interesting for mm -hmm. us. Uh, so that, uh, and again, through education, I'm sure that's transferred back. Uh, we did, through the uh, business school, the economic impact of the arts in yes, the community, you which you will see on a flyer. That's a great that study. That I, I, I growled about it because I wanted the front to say, done by USF St. Pete College of Business. <laughs> <laughs> but they said something about the arts on the front. Uh -huh. so, I, so, but in any instance, so we're involved in a lot. Uh, so. Being chancellor of a university, you know the sorts of things that make a great university. So what do you think makes a great city or town? The same quality. And what are they? Well, I think risk-taking, hmm. knowledgeable risk-taking, um, a unacceptance of the status quo, uh, a, a sense of energy, a non-critical environment. Hmm. What does that mean? That means, I say to uh, many of the people that work for me, I don't care what you try. Try anything with thought behind it. But not to try, just to doze around mm -hmm. day by day, business as usual, is just not what we're about. Mm -hmm. I think larger schools can lay back in their image and their history. A school like St. Pete cannot. It has to move forward rapidly. And what about St. Pete, the city? What sort the same of risk thing. taking? How would you, if, well, you know, what would you do? What would you risk take and move ahead with? Well, they're moving ahead in lots of areas. Mm -hmm. Whether those are the areas that should be mm -hmm. addressed, I think that'd be up for question. Well, what would you do? Personally? Yeah. <laughs> I'd renovate the pier. <laughs> <laughs> I personally happen to, to like it a great deal. Uh -huh. I, I don't tell people that often. Mm -hmm. And I've never told anybody that before. Well. But it's right out my window, and it's perfectly fine with me. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> I, what I'd take is, again, what, uh, what was started uh, with great enthusiasm. I think uh, the North Shore Pool, for example, oh. with its... Uh, with its slides and the fountains and all of that. <laughs> I think that we should do those things all the way down the waterfront. Mm. Fun, family things. Uh, a water park. Yes, but, uh, but, a, but a, not a, uh, 
Legoland water park. Or Bush Gardens. You know, yeah. uh, little family, mm -hmm. interesting things mm -hmm. that are curious to students and mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, St. Pete has changed since I've been here in an extraordinary and way. And how have you seen that change? Uh, I think that it is becoming a destination again for tourism, which mm -hmm. I think is great. And I think that it is a group of tourists that you want to have. Mm -hmm. And somehow that has happened mm -hmm. almost in spite of the planning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the city should stop worrying about being a city of wealthy older people. Mm -hmm. Being an older person, perhaps not as wealthy as the rest, I find that perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that uh, it should celebrate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in many towns and I've never had greater medical service, better mm -hmm. dentists, and anything else. And mm -hmm. not only that, these Why are you moving? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the trouble with having Jerry Sullivan yeah. North of Atlanta. I mean a husband. Oh, that's who I mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Four grandchildren, uh -huh. you know, and uh, in my view, still children to look after mm -hmm. as they move into their 50s. <laughs> they require a lot of care. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing you mentioned about the tourists that come here, one of the things that this USFSP study about the art showed was that the cultural tourist spends a significant amount more money than a regular tourist. So, I mean, the Dali Museum, this great museum we're in. MFA? MFA, um, the theaters, sure. the art center, all of those. Those are really responsible for that quality of, um, they like to go out to nicer restaurants and stay in fancy hotels and. Um, Fine with me. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Applause is always welcome. <laughs> so back to a sort of more serious uh, question. We've seen over the years um, a sort of anti-education, oh. anti-intellectual. And there was an article, S, um, a letter to the editor in the paper today about the Walmartization of education and how that would be the downfall of our country. Um, so how do you account for that? I, I mean, it's easy enough to account for. Okay. It's a terrible thing to correct. Uh, as mm -hmm. others have heard me say, I just go berserk. From 07 to 08, uh, $900 million was going into student financial aid for the for-profit universities. $900 million in one year alone. The next year, a billion four. $500 million of increased federal aid to for-profit schools in Florida alone. Hmm. What's happening is that higher ed in Florida is being privatized. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think people who are leading higher education in Florida, first of all, they don't find that point particularly interesting. I find it phenomenal. I find it the fact that the Times groans and moans about student loans and student debt, but they don't have the analysis anymore to look behind what that debt means. They raise cane about higher tuition and then they use national figures. The national average for tuition is like $9,000 a year. We're 47th in the state. Don't run an editorial about how costly it is in education, what a ter terrible thing it is to raise tuition, if you are underwriting more than half of a student's education each year. I don't understand, well, like part of it is the change in the newspaper world. I think that if indeed you had people reporting and looking into data rather than accepting PR reports produced by those who have some interest, mm -hmm. that they would understand the issues more clearly. Now, whether or not the state wants to pay for education, I think that's another matter. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at this point, they can't and don't. But when you say there's not enough money in Florida to fund a university, well, then look at the size of the budget. It's not whether there's any money in Florida, 
it's what your priorities are. Mm -hmm. and, and we just can't seem to get a hold and of that. Why is that? I mean, when I grew up, education was the thing. I mean, you wanted as much as you could get. You wanted the best quality you could get. I, everyone around me, I admired them, and I was t taught to admire them because they were educated. And now we don't see that. So that choice to not fund must come from not valuing it. But it's interesting the control. people that are making the decisions have all benefited, in many cases, mm -hmm. from extraordinary schools and their mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. It's like they were hatched, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and somehow or other, no one gave them the knowledge that they have, nor the mm -hmm. ability to reason. So uh, how can we change that around? What are your ideas about changing so we value education and all sorts of... Well, mean, I now education? become a political activist. <laughs> okay. Organized. 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 If the universities group themselves together rather than their own self-interest, and put all those alums to work and got people that valued education in the decision-making roles, mm -hmm. then I would have nothing to worry about. Hmm. But again, times are so tough. Everybody, it's a time of educational cannibalism. Hmm. Just make sure that the, I'm better off than the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me, uh, leadership seems to be a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. And again, the political structure, how much money does it take to run for office now? Mm -hmm. It a limits lot. the population right. a lot, mm -hmm. particularly those people interested in education. Mm -hmm. so, so, so who are your heroes out there? Uh, everybody knows this, and uh, this is not a political remark. Uh, please don't take it as so. But my hero, and since I've been here, has been Jack Lotvala. He has been a guiding force and a supporter for the university and for me personally. He is one of my and heroes. And who is he? He's a senator that represented our area until he's been redistricted. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is, in my view... State senator? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he has been extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he has expectations for his Senate that they uh, should be admired. And I am similar, similar in higher education. He is one of my one of my heroes. John Hitt, the president of Central Florida, is also one of my heroes. Uh, I think that he's done a perfectly marvelous job. Uh, Barron, FSU's new president, he's one of my heroes as well. And what have they done to make them your hero? Uh, uh, I think uh, Jack's moderate views in bringing consensus in a polarized world. Mm -hmm. By the way, others who know me know I'm an extremely liberal Democrat, so this probably does not help him one bit at all. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he does have a moderate point, and he does bring people together. And again, I see a lot of polarization going on. Uh, uh, John Hitt's very quiet. Uh, he understands uh, students need access. Uh, he, is, he, he is a wise leader. And Barron is new, and he is a great thinker. Uh, he's a, one of the first. And where is he? Florida State. Florida State. Came out, and he was one of the first people that talked directly about tuition and the need for it. If you look at the facts, families under forty thousand dollars who send their students to universities, those students get checks at the end of the year because of the loans and the and the scholarships mm -hmm. for low-income students. Those students that families that on the average pay $60,000 a year. Many of them get checks, no cost to their education at the end of the year. Students with families in the $100,000 range for a year will probably, on the average, pay no more than $2,300 because they're all bright future mm. scholars. Mm. Not all. I'm being too general here. So that what Barron brought into the discussion, that again, people do not take seriously, is what we should not be talking about tuition, but we should be talking about cost to the student. Mm. And since the highest price anybody pays in their education, either with Bright Futures or with grants or whatever, is about $2,300 a year. Wow, what so, a bargain. And this was, uh, and if anybody wants to go to the, uh, mm. uh, the State University System mm. website, this was put up in a fabulous uh, uh, um, table for all to see, 
before everyone voted on tuition for each institution. Mm -hmm. But everybody, the word has come down, there'll be no tuition increase, but actual cost to a student is where the discussion should be. Now we've talked about administrators and students. What about faculty? I mean, without faculty, nothing happens. Right. So how does all of this um, finances and all this sense of not valuing education affect the quality of the faculty and, and how, what the faculty members do? It does not affect faculty in a really noticeable way. Mm -hmm. I think they presume that that is handled by others who have that. Their responsibility is to their students. But it does, again, Baron again, who spoke out at the Board of Governors meeting, he said, my faculty is becoming a farm team mm -hmm. for other states. Right. So people can swoop in, mm -hmm. snap them up, because our raises have been minimal in the last few right. years. And so if the FSU faculty becomes a farm team, then think about my mm -hmm. role. I'm not a first choice institution. So that does leave our top faculty just sitting about waiting to be swooped out. Away. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, doesn't serve not only the students, but doesn't serve our community. Right. Because but as an example of being a swoopy, <laughs> thank you to the Huffs, we yeah. lurked around, and there's the national leader in Florida studies who is happily mm -hmm. working at North Florida. Swoop, and we went. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Okay. And so now he'll be coming to St. Pete. Michael mm -hmm. Francis will join us in August, and he is top of the heap. Uh, so from time to time, uh, mm -hmm. And we quick. have people in that department, school, right back there. Oh, we do. Yes. Good grief. Florida Studies is yeah. alive and well. What we have here is the biology department, which yes. is our new department, and Melanie's chairing it. Bob Dardan, lifetime extraordinary chair of Mass Common Journalism. And then we have Florida Studies with Gary and Ray, who you yeah. all know. Thank you all, by the way. Didn't see you. Yeah. <laughs> So um, one of the things that's um, particularly striking about you is that you're a woman. <laughs> I could go wild here, I woman. Know you <laughs> could. <laughs> Gary, is she correct? <laughs> and um, coming up from, um, you know, being a graduate student and moving through and becoming an administrator and eventually a chancellor. Um, uh, initially for women, that was not really a thing to do. Or, um, so can you talk about your journey through this as a woman and um, how that's been for you and how you've seen it change? Oh, again, starting from this point backwards. The one thing I do admire very much about Judy Genshaft is as a woman, she found nothing wrong with hiring another one. Mm -hmm. uh, some women leaders always feel that their cabinet or those people that report to them have to be all male. Mm -hmm. They somehow feel that you cannot look like you're going to have a great number of women in, on mm -hmm. your team. And that, I thought, was extremely remarkable. Mm -hmm. But long ago, uh, as I, I never planned to be an administrator. You don't ever plan, some people plan to do it. They say well, they want to grow up and be thus and so. That's not the case. But I can honestly say along the path that in my time, well, starting off with applying to college, uh, I wasn't admitted to Texas A&M. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was in the 80s, which was 50 years later, a Texas A&M asked for help. And I was saying oh. to myself, I wish I'd kept that letter. <laughs> 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 it would have been great fun. But, it, but in any instance, uh, for some reason, I have always had wonderful mentors, mm -hmm. uh, just extraordinary ones. And, and I was at Georgia State, and I was one, of one woman vice president with a group of men, assistant vice president, and they were all wonderful. And so I decided one day, I didn't really notice working with them that they were men or women. I just worked along on whatever project it was. And they said something about being a girl. Well, I was younger than they. And I said, you know, I said, could you please tell me why you think working with a woman is different? And I told you yes. this the other day. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, they all looked back and they said, well, Margaret, you were not in World War II. <laughs> and, and I thought, what a great answer. I said, now, <laughs> I said tell me why that, that's significant. And they said, we were all in different units in the service and we were so frightened and we were so young, we have that in common. We lived mm -hmm. through awful times and you don't even know what happened. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how remarkable. Mm -hmm. That is true. They trusted mm -hmm. one another. They had a shared background. And then I, I just thought that was, at first of all, I was so pleased that they answered me. As they were just, a, you know, we were all sitting around. And, they, and I said, do you have any other reasons? They said, yes. You listen to all the wrong music. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that was one thing. And then I ended up working with a man I admired a great deal. His name was, uh, well, there were several people at Georgia State. But uh, um, he, he was the provost and then became the president. And his mm -hmm. assistant had always been uh, usually a colonel or something like that. And again, a lot of my work is related to budgeting, money, uh, sometimes hard decisions. And, uh, and I asked my friend, Dr. Suttles, who uh, I adore, he's no longer with us. I said, Suttles, uh, why is it you find that I'm a she, you know? He says, the thing I find no so disconcerting is that you've got a man's mind in a woman's body. <laughs> I thought that was sort of strange, They're very too. insightful comments. Uh, yeah. but, but again, all these people were mm -hmm. speaking. All these people were my friends. Mm -hmm. Suttles long ago said, Margaret, you're going to go be a college president. I said, oh, no. Who would want to do such an awful thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're a chancellor. You're not a yeah. president. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and so what he did was at Georgia State, he put me with every single vice president for three months. I had to do everything about budgeting. I had to ever do anything about physical play. And I had to do anything about this, that, and another. He said, because that's what, that's what he was going to do. And it, I so found all of it. he was grooming you. Well, that's what he did. Yeah, and I said, huh. but I don't really want to be doing this. <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, but he, he, was, he also trained me up politically. Uh, I'll give you a side story about this. I was chair of a large uh, committee in uh, Georgia on technical education. And we were hiring a new executive director. And I had called the governor's office and asked him, uh, please tell me who are your favorite candidates. It seemed wise to do that when we started. Well, uh, we had three final candidates the night before the vote of this committee. And these committees included legislators and all sorts of interesting people, powerful people in Georgia. And I got a call from the governor's office, his, a, his uh, chief of staff, Margaret, you will appoint so-and-so, OK? And this governor uh, and Georgia State, my provost, was looking to become president. And uh, mm -hmm. I said, no. I said, I've asked you in the beginning. We've gone through all affirmative action procedures. I have a, I have a final group that will sue your socks off if we do what you're asking, and I'm not going to do it. Well, you're going to pay a terrible price. I said, not going to do it. So uh, being brave, I went and hid in the stairwell. <laughs> 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 well, Suttles, who was acting president at that time and had ambitions of his own, he was uh, older, so uh, uh, it was significant, was very close to the governor. So the governor calls Suttles and says, you know, that woman that works for you is being really difficult. We want so-and-so appointed as executive director of this committee. And so Suttles said, I'll take care of this. So he went to the office, and they said, you know, where's Margaret? Can't find her anywhere. <laughs> next, thing, next thing he knows is he finds me. He said, what are you doing in the stairwell? <laughs> I said, your friends are after me. <laughs> uh, I said, what do you want me to do, sir? Because I love this man. What do you want me to do? I will do anything you ask me to do. He said, I will ask you to go have a cup of tea with me, and we will not come back until this is all over. Mm. <laughs> integrity. The mm -hmm. man had integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, but so there have been people along the way mm -hmm. each time, you know, uh, that have, uh, have taught things in both direct and indirect ways. Have there been things that have been challenges because you're a woman? Oh, certainly. <laughs> 
My husband, for one. <laughs> <laughs> Long ago, one of the schools wanted a president, and I said, Jerry, what do you think about that? He just rolled his eyes, and he said, I just don't make cookies. <laughs> you know? he's, a, he's a banker. Yeah. Right. Right. And, uh, and, and then I took him to an academic conference. I said, Jerry, what do you think of the conference? He said, I would say they're all macadamia, academia nuts. <laughs> So I never took him to another conference. <laughs> but now he's a professor. Hmm. And he said, these people are really strange. Uh, he said, being a banker, he said, I'm teaching two courses this term. Doesn't seem like a lot of hard work to me. I said, say that to not a colleague. Yeah. Say not a word. And I said, and by the way, you are them. Okay. <laughs> but I think, I think the. Um, uh, well, I also promised Jerry Sullivan that I wanted five children and I wanted to be an at-home mother and cook. <laughs> Before you were married? Yes, and then we married and within 12 months I had redesigned the scheme, uh, <laughs> concluded what I needed to get a housekeeper, which meant to go to work quick. <laughs> Cut out on the first baby and never see the second. <laughs> They've had to adapt, you see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but how you manage family obligations, particularly I have a terrible passion for higher education and also for work. Mm. If there's something to be done, I just can't resist. Mm -hmm. You know, I just can't resist. And, uh, and so I think it takes a, a, a whole lot out of family when they mm -hmm. allow that to happen. And yeah. when you look at younger women who, um, you know, there's a lot of women who have um, lots of potential. Power, powerful jobs. Do you see that their lives are different or do they have similar challenges that you have or do you think that, or are they just different then? I think there are generational differences mm -hmm. with the women. Uh, they say the students are millennials now. Don't make it, take hard feelings here, guys. But they say the millennial population is a group of students one person might have a 54 average, and the night before the final, they go in and say, to, Professor, I realize I have a 54 average, but I believe we could talk this out. <laughs> <laughs> They're negotiators. Negotiators. So that we have a generation of negotiating women. And then remember X, the X generation. X generation. Again, in what I noticed the most different is that the uh, many of the faculty want a broad life that has a lot of family time, a lot of recreational time, and work time. In my world, it's all work. Mm -hmm. And so th that is a difference. And I think that we have different generations doing different things. Mm -hmm. and, and just like they talk about generations going to college, but these college graduates are all going into the workforce, and the mm -hmm. workforce is changing generationally mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, um, and if there's something happening around the campus and it has to go out in the morning at 9, I don't expect people to go race out the door at 5, you know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean 5 p.m. Yeah. You expect them to stay. In well, I, you know, if something's <laughs> due, it's due, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, uh, yes, you know. I understand that. Death to the person that <laughs> leaves. <laughs> so um, now that you're leaving, um, what do you see as the future of USF SP? Um, what do you look for the next chancellor to be? And what do you hope he or she, you know, what direction do you hope he or she goes Well, I into? think, I hope that they continue on a direction that's involves change. And in what way? Uh, you can't just, that you know, they, well, Higher education is changing in many ways. Uh, one example more than any, of course, would be online, how you move programs that are appropriate online. Mm -hmm. I would hope they would continue that interest. More than that, I would hope they would continue an interest in developing the faculty into new skills. The faculty role in higher education in the next 20 years will be very different than it is now. Hmm. Uh, two things are happening. They're great, huge, open source, courses being taught by huge, extraordinary researchers that are all free courses. 
Hmm. What are they called? Moogs now? Is that their name? Moogs, I think. Where are they? They're online. They're coming out of Berkeley. They're coming out of Harvard. They're coming out of Princeton. They are unique educational experiences being taught by senior scholars, and mm. all the courses are open to anybody, and they're all for free. And you go to them, or you do them online? online. They're online. online courses. Wow. And they are, they are something. They're now, called what? Moogs, I think. M-O-O-G-S? That's a guess. Uh, anybody's <laughs> into this? <laughs> Guys, anything about it? But again... Someone should Google it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in any instance, there are these open source, free, heavyweight courses. Now, hmm. because of those, again, it's, it's free. If you want to cut your faculty costs down, hmm. you'll bring in a, a MOOC that can't be beat academically. And many of the universities will put a graduate assistant supporting hmm. the free course. Uh -huh. And at the t this time, they don't offer credit. Hmm. But the institution itself could offer credit mm -hmm. using one of these courses. Right. That have teaching is, that's a fundamental mm -hmm. change in the professor. How many professors you need? If I need a professor mm -hmm. in biotechnology, there are probably six in the world that were really great. Why would I go pay three or four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars on one when mm -hmm. I can go get the same coursework? So we free? need a faculty union to make sure that no, you don't need a, stay I mean, Not that a union. You don't need a controlling factor. You need an instigation and innovative factor to find out how this can work and still support the model of the school that you want to have. Eckert is a, it, is a residential community. That's right. their, their way. University of Phoenix has 70% of their courses online right. and 30% face-to-face. For a model like St. Pete, I've always thought that you would have 30% online and 70% face-to-face. So the model that you choose, again, I see the College of Business playing a serious role in St. Petersburg. Hmm. And many of those students want to take their courses online. Mm -hmm. So indeed, how, how you adapt. Again, faculty as independent contractors. That means um, I dial up, uh, Troy University, for example, has a number of faculty that are not full-time with them. Mm -hmm and they teach a course for them. So they're mm -hmm. independent contractors. They might teach for Troy. They might teach for Phoenix. They might mm -hmm. teach for the University of Georgia all at the same time. But so online, so they don't physically Or face to face. They mm -hmm. fly over and mm -hmm. teach over here and fly over there. Mm -hmm. So that that is another role the mm -hmm. faculty is moving. The faculty is independent contractors. Mm -hmm. So that's another whole issue. That's very different. Oh, very yeah. different. So what does it mean for the faculty that are under 50 years old now? They have to know how to live in that environment. Mm -hmm. As a woman who was formerly president of Phoenix said, she was at a meeting with Harvard and Princeton and Yale, and she said to them, she was president out at Phoenix, she said, I want to thank you for the fine professors you've hired, the huge benefits you pay them, the wonderful laboratories and offices that they have. They work for me, too. <laughs> hmm. You know, so. Uh, so the world in the professorship is changing dramatically. Mm -hmm. The thing that I find is that many people in those roles do not see how fast it's changing, mm -hmm. particularly the younger ones. So that the younger ones really ought to get about. I said to my faculty, it caused a terrible unrest. I said, go teach for somebody else. Go teach an online course and see the systems they use. And then come back and tell us what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. What, they said. You just told us to teach for someone else online. I said, I did, because I want all those experiences to come back and make us even stronger because of it. What's the best model out there? Seems to me they'd be paid $3,000 to do it. Mm -hmm. Saves me $3,000 of training. And they'll go find out what all our competitors are doing. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great idea. But, but indeed. Do you want a job as a chancellor? No. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, uh, but again, the higher ed community is changing dramatically. Huh. And as the state cuts back money, what does that happen? UF doesn't accept more students. FSU doesn't uh, limits enrollment. USF limits enrollment. New College limits enrollment. All the schools are limiting enrollment because of the amount of money it costs to educate mm -hmm. these people. Where are these kids going? Mm -hmm. You know. So, but anyway, that's enough of all that. Um, 
Who wants to ask a question? Yeah. Noel. Now, Noel Smith is, um, <laughs> she's from USF Tampa. I must have closed this. <laughs> Special education, psychology, why students didn't learn. I was off in my mm -hmm. youth thinking that obviously anybody can learn. Anybody can learn if I can just figure out how to teach them. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I stopped being a teacher. One day I walked in, I was at Bernal, and I walked into the bookstore, and my mind said, that is the dumbest young woman I have ever met in my whole life. I can't teach her anything and I stopped teaching that term. Wow. Because I, up in, I mean, I'm five or 10 or 15 years been saying, if I could just figure out how, anybody can learn anything. Uh, but, uh, and again, because I was trying to figure out how people learn, I had a whole bunch of psych, which I, which I love, and I find it very helpful in the job I have now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ms. Top. Yes. Easy enough. It's been going on for years. All a bachelor's in three years means is that you go to summer school. Mm -hmm. Isn't it Hazleton or something like that? Uh, no, I think it's up to the student. Many students, for example, use summer to work, you know, and they need it to get partially through. But no, uh, if a student is bright, talented, does not need to get money or support themselves in any way, and uh, would be dedicated to the task. We have students that do that and have always done it. But you're talking about a university. I think it's As Hazleton or it. that it's a requirement at their university that it's now, a three-year university. Uh, again, why is it such a good idea? Of course, if a student's with us and uh, it's costing them mm -hmm. four or five thousand dollars a year, not counting on how to live, and uh, and they get through their program in three rather than four years, and their salary is $37,000, economically, the three-year degree is a wise choice. Mm -hmm. Again, for the institution itself, like the University of Florida, it is also a wise choice because they can accept more students because their physical plant is operating all around the year. So, but again, I think that some, the students that go to USF St. Pete uh, are typically uh, not taking full loads every term because they have to work. And each year they have to work more. Some of our students have two jobs and a full load. I don't know how they do it. Mr. Huff? Oh, I tried. I, I'm a serial retiree. Uh, I found out, again, I've retired uh, once when my mother was ill. <laughs> and then a friend of mine called, and this is how I got back into accreditation. He ran the accrediting group, and he called up. And while mother was ill, I went out and bought two horses. And it was great therapy. I could take care of her. I could ride the horses and carry on. And my friend at Sachs called, and he didn't say who he was. He just said, Bet those horseshoes are expensive. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and I went back to work, and it was interesting. I'd been out of work for two years, and there was a massive amount of work they'd saved up because someone had <laughs> retired. And it was stacked around the desk. And the whole first week, I could look at the pile of stuff, say, ah, that requires some thinking and move it to the left. <laughs> <laughs> Took the next pile. So all at the end of the week, all it had done with no decisions, no work, is just move quietly around the desk. And I thought, never again, never retire, because it does, uh, in my world, uh, it slowed me down. It showed mm -hmm. how much difference uh, your organization skills, mm -hmm. your decision making, your risk taking, mm -hmm. I mean, it went. It went into the barn. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so no, I'll, 
I will enjoy doing anything with good and interesting people. Hmm. And I'll conjure them right up. <laughs> Another question? Tired. They want to go Tired. home. Aww. You've taught students. Can't you tell? <laughs> well, it's good because it's time to stop anyway. So um, please let's um, thank Margaret Sullivan, Dr. Margaret Sullivan. <laughs> we won't have too many more times to applaud her. And um, I hope you remember us all and come back. And so let's applaud her again so she won't forget. <laughs>